We also have other pictures of you, so. Or you can make a face. 
release, but you know that's going to be on. That's going to be perpetuated on the website. I will just leave it up to you to talk to the crowd. Uh, Bob, this is uh, just going to have you do the opening remarks and everything. Okay. Uh, just hand me a mic or whatever you're ready to do. I will do that. You're actually, you can just start with the ring there. I'm just going down the line. Um, we'll have to start the microphones on your side. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jeff Hetrick. I'm the Executive Director of the Ottawa Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome everybody to tonight's forum. We had asked all of the commissioner candidates to come tonight and be able to get their message out, say why they think they should be the one that gets elected to our city council. So. The way we're going to be running this tonight, our master of ceremonies is Jay Lesur of WCMY for a few more days at least. <laughs> <laughs> and he is going to be uh, our master of ceremonies and also reading the questions. Our format for tonight, each candidate will get 90 seconds to introduce themselves. 
We will go through the question and answer session. We'll read a question and three candidates will get to answer that question. And then we will go on to different questions in order to cover a wide variety of topics. After the questions have been read, each candidate will have 90 seconds to give a quick summary, uh, highlight their campaign, convince you voters why you need to vote for them. And that will be the way our program is. So right now, I will turn the program over to Jay and let him roll. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Let's give these folks a big hand, your fellow <laughs> residents of Ottawa. It takes a lot to, number one, campaign for an elected office. And uh, congratulations to all 10 of you for taking this jump. Let's meet everybody, do our introductory remarks, and Josh, you lead it off. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Josh Moore. Um, I'd just like to tell you how I got to this spot. I worked for the city for the last four years, and uh, I've seen that communication between the workers and City Hall has not been the greatest. So I joined the Park and Rex Board to try to get some stuff in the parks done that I thought were being a little bit ignored. And the communication between the boards and City Hall isn't the greatest, so I'm here to try to change that and make the change it for the better and make the communication the top priority for the city, the boards, the workers, and the citizens of Ottawa and make that, make Ottawa great. Okay, Dylan. Uh, Dylan Conmey, I'm the manager at Prairie Fox Books. Um, I moved to Ottawa in 2012. I'm married. Uh, my wife is a business owner here in Ottawa. I have three stepkids. The youngest is still um, at Ottawa High School. Um, I have three grandkids, and um, I see a lot of friendly faces here, so I, first of all, I want to say that's great, except for the Reddick Mansion hecklers up in the front. I see you, too. Um, I, um, I've, I've been very involved in events in town, and I'm, I'm very excited to be running for commissioner. I think that there's people are just ready for a change. As someone who works downtown, I see that side of things, and as someone who lives in Ottawa, I see a lot of things that happen, obviously, as a resident, and I think there's a lot of focus downtown, but there needs to be a lot of focus outside of town, and um, I'm hoping we can make that happen. Thank you. Katie. Good evening. I'm Katie Tricoli, and I would like to say thank you to the Ottawa Area Chamber of Commerce and the Crossbridge Church for hosting the commissioner's debate tonight. I'd also like to say to the candidates that step forward that are running for office, I commend you for your efforts to lead the community. My fellow citizens, I'm running to represent the best interests of Ottawa residents, your interests. I am open to your ideas and the future of our community. I grew up in Ottawa. This is my home. I am the daughter of a World War II paratrooper who saw terrible things. He made three combat jumps, fought in the Battle of the Bulge, and participated in the liberation of Woblin concentration camp. He taught me to stand up for those people who cannot stand up for themselves. That's why I'm here tonight. I have been involved in our community, veterans issues, environmental issues, the arts and historic preservation. I am passionate. Let's work together to make Ottawa the best it can be. If you share my passion for our community, please consider a vote for me on April 4th or before if you early vote. Thank you. Matt. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Matt Skelly. I have the honor to be up here with these nine other um, individuals seeking your vote and your support. Uh, I'm not an Ottawa native, I readily admit that, and I think that's okay. Um, I've gone through therapy for it, but um, <laughs> I think it's okay. But the minute we got here and we moved here, we actually sought to move to Ottawa. And when we came here, being involved in a community was something that I was no stranger to. Uh, we quickly got involved in various parts of our community and have been involved for the past 17 years. 
I've been on the St. Columba School Board, which then merged, helped merge three schools into Marquette Academy, and it's a board I've sat on ever since. And that's been about 17 years, or 16 years, and my daughter's only 10, and then she's there now. I've been on the Ottawa Visitor Center Board working for tourism. I hear a lot about tourism. I've been doing it for over 10 years. I'm the past chair. I was one of the ones instrumental in bringing the Visitor Center from its previous location at the Reddick Mansion, which was an awesome place, to a more visible location right at the beginning of our downtown, right where our tourists can stop and see what's going on and be part of the activities in and around Ottawa year round. I've been very lucky to be asked to be part of our museum, our community museum, and the Ottawa Historical and Scouting Heritage Museum, which showcases some of the most amazing things in our community. I'm very happy to be part of their board, too. And with that, I'm going to move on. <laughs> Tom? I want to thank the Chamber for sponsoring tonight's forum and Jay for moderating. I also want to thank you, the citizens, for attending tonight and those watching on YouTube. I'm Tom Gainier, and I'm a candidate for re-election as commissioner. I've lived in Ottawa all my life. I've served for almost 25 years on the Ottawa Fire Department, retiring as a lieutenant in 2011. I own Gainier Appraisal Service and practice law part-time with the Misco Law Center. I served for six years on the county board, and four of those years as chairman of the finance committee and then vice chairman of the board also. I'm a former president of Ottawa Firefighters Local 523, and former chairman of the Ottawa Plan Commission. The city was very good to me while I was served as a firefighter, and now I'm trying to give back to the city and the wonderful citizens by serving as a commissioner for the past eight years. Over the past four years, we as a council have paved more streets and alleys, improved and redeveloped more parks, repaired and replaced more water and sewer mains, and applied for and received more grants than any four-year period prior. I believe that my background, education, and proven track record uniquely qualifies me to be reelected, and I ask for your vote on April 4th. Thank you. Clayton. Hi, my name is Clayton Brown. I'm 40 years old. I'm uh, engaged with two children, 11 and 8. They both attend the Ottawa Public Schools. I graduated the uh, Ottawa Township High School back in 01. I've been involved, or I'm sorry, I've been employed with the uh, operative, operative plaster, plasters and cement masons local 11 for 17 years. The last three I've served as a business agent and director of organizing. I've also served as our apprenticeship board secretary. I'm also on the Illinois Valley Building Trades Delegate. I'm on the Illinois Valley uh, Labor Management Board of Directors. I'm also on the Illinois Valley Federation of Labor. Um, I've coached flag football, t-ball, and little league. Um, I've also coached uh, YMCA basketball. I've been involved in many pro uh, projects in the community. I've helped out at the, uh, the Northside Little League Diamond. I've also been involved in the Lincoln Douglas All Access Park. Um, I've been involved with Labor of Love, the United Way Food Pantry, the uh, uh, Breakfast for the Ottawa Veterans. I've also been a part of Smoketoberfest, Touch a Truck, and I've also assembled bicycles for the food pantry. Thank you. Marla. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm Marla Pearson and I'm asking for you to re-elect me as commissioner for the city of Ottawa. First of all, I do want to thank the chamber and Crossbridge for sponsoring this event. I also want to thank my husband James, who has put up with all of this nonsense, and my parents that are here tonight for their support. I'm currently commissioner of streets and public improvements, and I'm also general sales manager at Jeff Perry uh, Buick GMC in Peru, Illinois. And throughout my first four years as commissioner, we have resurfaced 20 miles of city streets, seven parking lots, 85 alleys, installed 188 sidewalk ramps. I worked with the City Recreation Board to reconstruct Eastside Park and Thornton Park. Project Inclusive Park was finished. A fitness park was added to Kiwanis Park. And an updated 18-hole disc golf course was added to the Fox River Park. And construction has started on the pool. I also have led a group of volunteers every Thursday morning that we meet and we weed, pull weeds in the downtown beds and bump outs in the parks. I'm running for re-election because I feel that it was a very successful first four years and I want to finish where, what we have started. JJ. 
Good evening, and thank you, Jay. My name is James Less. I'd like to also take this moment to thank the Chamber for planning tonight's forum and for Jay Lesseur moderating the event and also everyone that's in attendance tonight. Tonight's audience is a testament of the passion we share for the future of this great city and the leadership that will guide us in the years to come. A little bit about myself. I was born in Ottawa to my parents, Jay and Sue Les. My siblings are Kim and TJ. I'm an uncle to Jake, Jewel, Taryn, Lakin, and Mason. I am proudly a graduate of Ottawa Township High School in the University of Kentucky, where I received a Bachelor's of Science in Landscape Architecture. Today I practice as a state licensed professional landscape architect in a progressive community in the northern suburbs and serve as your Commissioner of Public Health and Safety, overseeing the operations of the police and fire departments. On a national level, I hold certifications from the National Park and Rec Association as a certified park and recreation professional and a certified playground safety inspector. Prior to my appointment to the council in 2014 to finish the term of Ed Whitney, I served on the Ottawa Planning Commission, Ottawa Tree Board, and Playground and Recreation Board. I continue to be an active volunteer with the United Way Labor of Love and the Ottawa First Fireworks Committee. Ottawa is a great place to live, work, and play, and I'm proud to call this town of Two Rivers my home. I thank you all for attending and hope tonight's forum provides valuable insight on your decision to vote for the future of Ottawa. Thank you. Wayne? Well, first of all, Jay, thank you very much for moderating. I'd like to thank the Chamber for putting this on for us. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity for us to speak and have a good time and let the people know where we're coming from. Uh, and thank you, Crossbridge, for hosting this. I know they had a little bit of problem finding a place to have it, and I really appreciate them letting us be here. My name is Wayne Eichelkraut. I'm seeking re-election to the Ottawa City Council. I was born and raised in Ottawa, graduate of Ottawa High School. Earned an associate's degree from IVCC. I'm a Vietnam veteran, a retired Caterpillar, retired from Caterpillar Tractor Company, and a retired UAW member. I'm seeking another term for commissioner because I enjoy representing the people of the city of Ottawa. We have accomplished much during my tenure and I plan to keep this trend. We as a council, as you've heard from uh, Marla, Tom, and JJ, we have done a lot over the last four years with the grants, with the streets, with the parks, with the water play at Thornton Park. Um, so, you know, we as a council, we've done a lot. And I make, to make Ottawa a better place to play, work for all of our citizens. There's still more to do, and there's always more to do. I'm dedicated to city, and I guarantee you I will put the time in to help this city flourish. And it's just not making a meeting every two weeks, okay? It's hours on hours and end. Then I got the red flag again. So anyway, I... <laughs> Some of my qualifications, 24 years as commissioner, 12 years. <laughs> Brent? I'm Brent Barron, and uh, I get to follow Wayne. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Ottawa. I know many people in this room. But for those of you who don't know who I am, I'll just tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm married. I have two children. Um, my daughter's currently serving in the U.S. Army. Uh, my son is living at home. He works at the Earlville Co-op. My wife works at the OSF Medical Center, and uh, she's a registered dietitian. I went to college. I got out of college. I didn't know what I was going to do, and I accidentally ended up in the federal government. I've dedicated my life working for the people, not only of Ottawa, but for the United States. I w I've dedicated my whole career to serving the people. I've dedicated in the last 24 years of my life to serving the people of this community. I'm the chair of the Ottawa Tree Board. I'm the current chair of the Ottawa Plan Commission. I've served on the form of government committee. I volunteered for numerous uh, charities in town. I was a member of the board of directors of the Easter Seals of LaSalle and Bureau County. I was the chair of that board. I volunteered for the uh, St. Baldrick's and I willingly donated my hair every year um, to raise funds for cancer, kids with cancer to find a cure. So I'm, I care about this community. Everybody in this room cares about this community. That's why you're here. 
Hopefully tonight you'll hear from us what we want to do in the next four years. And you take that information tonight, and when you go to the polls, you cast your ballot. Thank you very much, and let's get this going. All right, Brent, just hold on to that microphone. You get the first crack at question number one. And I'll just tell the audience, we've got the questions in a, in a bucket over here, and I'm just sticking my hand in, and we're pulling them out as they uh, come up. Recently, there have been numerous explosive or chemical contaminant concerns in our surrounding community. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> How would you address or ensure the safe handling, storage, and transportation of potentially explosive or hazardous chemical contaminants to ensure the safety of our citizens? I get this question. <laughs> okay, as the chair of the Plant Commission, we had a hearing. Lots Trucking came to the Plant Commission and they proposed to lease the former Kmart facility to uh, store product from Keras Chemical. And part of that chemical is potassium permanganate or whatever it is. I mean, permanganate, yeah. Anyway, they came to the Plan Commission, they had their proposal, they had all their safety data. Their proposal was reviewed by the city staff. It was sent to the fire department, the fire department reviewed it, the fire department didn't have an issue with it. We had our hearing, we gave the public an opportunity to stand up and present their concerns. We had, oh, I got 15 seconds left, thank you. Um, but anyway, we had our hearing, we implemented our conditions and we made our recommendation to see council and these guys passed it. So you can ask Wayne. <laughs> well, first of all, number one, we're gonna start out by working with the planning commission. We do rely on the planning commission for a lot of stuff like that, but we also did our due diligence, okay? Uh, I actually took a trip over there, went into the building, took a look around, uh, looked at their safety precautions, looked at what was going on, uh, basically, and uh, other people can verify this for me, 1% uh, of the building has this here chemical in it that they're talking about. The rest of it has buckets and some other kinds of material. This is lot trucking. This isn't Keras chemical, okay? This is lot trucking doing a little bit of storage, and it's going to be a long time before Keras chemical gets packed up and gets going again, but you know, the EPA was there, uh, they got sprinkler systems in there, it's locked up in a cage only because homes, it's used to uh, cut cocaine, that's why it's locked up. So that was some of the things I had, and here we are with the rest. <laughs> finish, finish your thoughts, just okay? I mean, the red flag is there, but finish your thoughts, JJ. As, as Brent indicated, it was brought to the Planning Commission for re review as a conditional use permit in that area. Signs were posted, a uh, meeting was held, it was unanimously approved by the Planning Commission, it came on to the city for approval. Uh, all precautions were taken with the fire department to review it, our building inspector to go through it, check to see what concerns there may be within, within the facility, within the neighborhoods with it, and ultimately, the city council did approve it. Uh, now we're looking afterwards of the fire that occurred in the explosion in, uh, in Lay Cell, and obviously there are some more concerns with the material. Uh, the MSDS sheets were looked at, the hazard, the hazard characteristics of the material. Everything was looked at and making a determination with it. And at that time, with our best guess, we did not feel that there was an issue with having that stored in a proper, safe manner. Since then, the fire department, all levels through the fire department and all different, uh, our different uh, groups with them have been through the facility and we're checking that out and monitoring it, so. Anybody else want to touch on this one that's got something that nobody else has said? Yeah. We'll just go on down here. Yeah, I also went through uh, the warehouse and the one thing that's different, first of all, Keras Chemical has been around for 150 years. But what they are doing is they are making the product, they are mixing the product. This is a storage unit. There are no open containers there. Um, in order for that to ignite, it needs to have something to make it ignite, another chemical or a spark or something. Um, there is, it is stored by itself and it is fully enclosed. 
So it is, they've taken many safety precautions. They have followed all of OSHA, and I feel that it's a safe storage area. Katie, you had your hand up. Uh, Tommy, you want to jump in too? Okay. Katie, you can go first. We now have 55,000 square foot of chemical storage in a facility that wasn't built to house chemical storage. It's not a matter of when. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when there's going to be a catastrophe at the South Town Mall. What's your plan for the three grade schools, the senior living centers, and the residents of the south side of Ottawa when we have a fire or a tornado that rips the roof off of that building? I want to get rid of that from our community. It's not acceptable in that location. Tom, did you want to jump in on this here before we move on? Currently, they have 47,000 square feet of space over there. They are expanding with another 8,000. Less than 500 square feet contains the potassium permanganate. Potassium permanganate is only a problem if it comes in contact with an organic substance. There are no organic substances at the facility. The rest of the facility is used for storing the containers, the new containers to put the potassium permanganate in, diatomaceous earth, and filter sand. There probably will never be more than the 500 square feet worth of potassium there because it goes out just as soon as it comes in because it's used uh, throughout the world, actually, for uh, um, cleaning drinking water. Dylan, you want to uh, chime in? Uh, I think it's important to note that it shouldn't have become an issue because of the explosion. Um, pretty much chemicals being stored in an old mall is probably not, you know, for all the important decisions that get made and decisions that don't get made lightly in the history of a certain business, um, that rushing into storing something you know, into a Southtown Mall, while still maintaining residents of, of uh, government companies that are there, government organizations that involve people going in and out for their um, benefits and such so close by, uh, it shouldn't have taken the explosion. So these things probably, a lot more effort should have been made to find a better situation um, to house these chemicals. There's a lot more that goes into chemicals, even if they're closed in barrels. Um, and that's coming from chemical knowledge that I have. So I, I think it shouldn't have taken an explosion to suddenly be hyper aware that perhaps it was a bad idea. Anybody else? Let's pass the microphone back to Marla, and we'll go to the next question. Ottawa Police Chief Rent Rolson recently hosted a public meeting at City Hall regarding downtown parking. In your opinion, what needs to be done to improve downtown parking for businesses, residents, and tourists? So I do feel that there is a parking problem. Um, a lot of that problem is people that work downtown at the courthouse, businesses using the three hour parking all day, parking in front of other businesses. Um, there is plenty of parking and parking lots. I know that there has been an argument whether the parking lot is cleaned in time, if the walkway is cleaned in time for them to get to their businesses and they want to um, get to their job without going through the inclement weather. And I understand that. I think Brent Rolson's meeting was very good and it's a start a discussion of maybe what we need to do and have a better plan and um, um, when we have our march 16th budget we are going to have a workshop about continued talking about a, a parking project around court street madison street and some other lots that need to be redone clean yeah, I believe there's a parking issue downtown as well. Um, obviously, there's a lot of businesses down there. They attract customers. Obviously, the employees of the uh, of the businesses, they need, all need places to park. Um, I believe we need to come up with a comp comprehensive plan and uh, take care of the parking issue. Tom? 
as Marla pointed out, the, we do have a parking problem downtown, and most of it is caused by employees of the businesses parking on the street and moving their uh, cars to uh, avoid getting a ticket in three hours. We need to find a way to uh, control that, and I do also like the, the some of the suggestions that the police chief had, especially like doing a permit for the employees and the outlying lots so that they don't have to park on the street or they won't park on the street. Um, and I'm open to uh, more solutions to this issue because I don't know if we have all the answers. I know we don't have all the answers and we'll have to find better solutions for that. Dylan, you want to chime in on something that nobody's brought up yet? Uh, yeah, I think an important issue that doesn't get brought up and as, as someone who works downtown, yes, obviously there's a parking issue. Uh, customers come in a lot out of town or in town and say there's no parking. But more importantly, um, the parking lot behind the bookstore has approximately almost 80 spots in it, I believe, and none of them are ADA accessible. We have plenty of customers and just people who walk in town or visit in town that need handicapped parking, that have walkers, that have wheelchairs. And according to ADA Illinois law, um, there are supposed to be for 80 spots at least five handicapped spots that are marked in parking lots or nearby with striped um, access spots next to them so that the doors can open and allow people to get out. And it's really hard to keep telling customers that there is no handicapped parking nearby except for maybe a couple spots on the street if they can get to them. So I think that's a big issue. Josh, you want um, yeah, I feel like uh, something that wasn't addressed was uh, the whole thing about talking to the people before the parking spots were gone to really make this a big issue. I think there should have been a town hall meeting or something with the residents and the businesses around there to see what would have been a better su suggestion for them than to, to lose a lot of our parking spots. And I feel that the city is 100% able to clear all the parking lots uh, of snow and all that if, the, if, the, if they make the parking uh, uh, available for them. All right, pass it down to James Less. If you, uh, JJ, you've got something that nobody's brought up yet? Yeah, yeah I, I believe we do have some parking issues downstairs or uh, downtown. Uh, some of the responses were indicative of that. I, I think moving forward, uh, there was, I know there was some disappointment and some frustration and some changes that were made downtown, primarily on Court Street. And I know there were some concerns that there was the lack of notification, uh, which I agree with as well. As a commissioner voting on some voting on items that I was unaware that I was actually ap approving some of those major modifications at that time, I would strongly recommend moving forward into the future as we are aware of a parking issue downtown, that if we are making major modifications that are gonna, gonna affect the number of places that we do have do for people to, to park that we do have some kind of correspondence with the community and get some input before those changes are made and be proactive about it versus reactive. Thank you. Wayne, you, you've got one more point? Yeah, I just want to uh, say something. Basically, after talking to one of the people that are running for mayor, okay, there is a parking lot behind this building that is vaguely used, hardly used at all. Uh, if you go on Columbus Street, there's another parking lot. By goes down to the YMCA that's barely used at all. One of the major parking places that is used is the one behind uh, the pizza place there and the home hardware area there. But I mean, there is plenty of open parking, but like I said, a lot of people do park in front of the buildings and we do have problems a lot of times with the courthouse taking up spaces that we need. Okay, let's move on to the next. Uh, Matt, you wanna chime in on this? You've got the next question coming too, so. I. We have a parking problem, and the thing I keep hearing is everybody, it's such a problem, oh my, oh my. That's a good thing. That means we have businesses downtown. We have people who wanna come to our town, and it's a good problem to have, and I, I think it's a, a great opportunity for us to say, how can we be you know, different? How can we solve this problem? People want to go to Naperville all the time. They want to go downtown Chicago. You're going to park three, four, five blocks away. I remember at a town hearing on ja about Jackson Street, someone making the comment, I wish it was like it was 10, 15 years ago. Well, that's because there was no businesses downtown. And so you could park everywhere you wanted to park. So we have a good problem here, and I'm excited about the opportunity 
to make it right and get more parking downtown because we have businesses downtown and people want to come here, that's a good thing. All right, let's move on to another question. And Matt Skelly, you're uh, first up for this one. Please share your vision as an elected city commissioner for the development of the downtown riverfront and how would you achieve this vision? I love this question um, because my vision is that on the second weekend of May in two or three years, um, we're gonna be finishing a marathon down at this completed park. Uh, and that's one of the, the things I like about the vision for the, the downtown park. And I only say the marathon because it's near and dear to my heart. But I, I'm excited about an opportunity to have an open space, the concerts on the river, um, the YMCA, the game changer, everybody keeps talking about that will bring the community together and, and this pinnacle thing right on the riverfront. Um, I think that it definitely will bring the community together and, and have an open space to have the concerts, the festivals um, in a world-class environment. So I'm excited about the plans I've seen and, and I would be excited as a city official to help bring that to fruition. Katie. Thank you, Jay. The Jordan Block and the um, area where Central School was uh, to be developed for um, a park and, and civic use should include boat docks as we should embrace the, the people that are on the river that are you know going up and down um, the Great Loop and so forth because those people are tourists who can bring um, dollars to our downtown. We need to review that plan and perhaps figure out a way to pro provide fuel for those boaters. And we need to look at that plan and, and determine how we're going to handle the housing and the other issues that are going to be there. I think it's gonna be a beautiful park for our community and it's an opportunity, but we better not make a mistake in what we do. Dylan? Um, I love the idea. I think that, as Katie said, um, the docks are important. Um, the Obviously, rivers are important in this town. And I think the important thing will be to focus on once that area is built and if the if if it's going to focus on a, a clamshell band area that we really utilize it for what the community wants to bring in and and not just focusing on the same type of activities over and over and over again i think we need to make sure we're using that for a widespread of different events for all ages um, instead of the same old same old that we keep getting and um really utilize it for the whole community, whether that be uh, kids entertainers and and senior entertainers, uh, anything across the board. I think we need to make sure if that much money is going into the park that it focuses on the entire community. All right, anybody else have a thought that hasn't been shared yet? Let's go back down to the end of the row here and uh, uh, Wayne and then JJ and, and Brent. We'll just <clears throat> to put things a little bit in perspective with the, the entire riverfront that we do have in Ottawa, uh, currently we do have the construction happening with the YMCA. The city has also received a grant to develop that waterfront, the former central school site, into an amphitheater area. At the same time, the city of Ottawa recently received a grant from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources for an OSLAD to <clears throat> for the redevelopment of Allen Park. The, the reality of that is within the next year and a half to two years, Ottawa, as far as I remember, is going to have construction going on both sides of the river. It is going to be at a very exciting time with a lot of very beautiful things happening within this community. That being said, we will be receiving the grant with the amphitheater. The vision with this is to keep moving forward to attract more development along that and keep the momentum going to bring more tax revenue and tourism into our community. Thank you. Okay, Wayne Uncle Crowd, and then we'll go to Brent Barron. Yeah, I like to, I really agree with JJ, what JJ just said. Uh, you know, a lot of people looked at us like when we were working with the YMCA to get that going down there. Uh, we actually put some money, uh, sold them some land for a real low price, uh, because the main reason is the development in that area. 
what will spur everything going is the economic development up on top of the hill, overlooking the park, overlooking the river. Uh, I, you know, I look back at when I was doing Thunder on the River, it would have been a beautiful thing to have a park there for people to actually sit there and watch the races go on. But we do have a comprehensive plan for that. It might have to be a little bit fine-tuned. As everybody probably knows, everything can't work out perfectly. But I think it'll be a beautiful area, and it'll be a draw to people coming to Ottawa. Brent? Thank you, Wayne, for mentioning the comprehensive plan, because the Plan Commission has been working on this for years. And people in this room need to understand there's two competing plans for the riverfront. One has the amphitheater, the civic use with the YMCA, and then there's going to be a commercial mixed-use building on the north edge of the park. One, pan, one plan has that building built right on top of the park and the street staying right where it is. So basically the park is going to be walled off and you won't be able to see it. The, the plan commission has a, a different plan. We have the city moving the road to the south, preserving the view of the park, preserving the view of the amphitheater, and building the commercial space behind it where the street and the current parking lot is. So if you want to look at this plan, go to the city, the city website, look at the comprehensive plan, and both of those competing plans are there. You know where I stand on what I want to do. I want to preserve the riverfront for everybody in this community to enjoy, not just people that are going to come in here and buy a $500,000 condo and then look over the park. And then pass that down, if you would, uh, to a Katie Tricoli. you have something you want to add? I was told by a, a citizen that Shoreline Boat Club built a structure on the island in the Illinois River. I tried to get out there to take a picture and it's pretty hard to see, but I wonder how they got the permitting for that and what that does to our floodplain ordinance. Wayne? Well, first of all, uh, the structure we have on the island out there, we did not build, Katie, okay? We took an old structure, modified it, and raised it 12 feet out of the floodplain, okay? We got tired of cleaning it out, taking the mud out of it, and losing our tools and stuff that we store. So we talked to Matt Stafford about telling him that we were going to take this structure and raise it. We were going to make sure we put a new roof on it, some new siding, but we actually raised it up out of the floodplain. And I believe that, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, you got to keep stuff out of the floodplain. And I wish we could actually lift the whole shoreline building out of there, but I don't have millions of dollars. Okay. Anybody else want to, uh, Josh, you want to jump in on that one? You'll get the next question, too, by the way. Uh, yeah, I agree that it's a great idea to do the improvements on the riverfront. I also think in the planning we need to look into maintaining the stuff we already have. I know phase one needs a lot of love. There's a lot of overgrown stuff. And then on the Allen Park side, uh, to get rid of the old bathroom and the old stage concrete should be part of the plan myself. To, and putting all this nice stuff in and leaving eyesores I don't think is the, the best plan, but I just hope that's part of the plan of redoing all the riverfront is taking care of the old stuff too. Okay, Josh Moore, just hold on to that microphone, and you get the next question that we'll pose to the panel. And uh, it is, what are your thoughts on uh, if Ottawa should adopt home rule, or what about a city manager changing the form of government? Um, I think that uh, we need to have more of like a town hall thing, in my eyes, to have more uh, meetings on stuff before decisions are made. I think that is what I feel is most important to our government right now is to get the public's input before major decisions are made and get their concerns and their ideas so that we can all come together as a community as a great idea for the moving forward and the big plans and have make sure that they are involved in all of the decision making instead of just telling them afterwards. Okay, if you'd pass that microphone back down to Brent Barron. We had our format tonight set up for uh, all 11 candidates to be here. We only have 10, so we'll skip position 11. And Brent Barron, you can be the final answer on this one. Uh, I served with Tom years ago, probably about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, 
um, form of government, and we looked at home rule, we looked at city manager, um, and the decision on that committee at the time was to adopt a city administrator, not a city manager, um, or pursue a city administrator. Um, one thing about home rule, it gives the community more input into what happens here. A lot of laws passed in the state of Illinois limit our ability to what we want to do. If we were a much bigger community, we'd get home rule automatically. LaSalle, Utica, I think Peru, all have home rule. And I don't see them running amok. I think home rule would be a good thing for our community. It'd give us a lot of input on what we do in this community. And it'd get a lot of, uh, give us another opportunity to just grow and make Ottawa a better place. Katie, you have another take on this? And then, then we can go to Tom Gainier. City manager form of government is a bad thing because you're gonna bring somebody in who is only interested in making their paycheck and doesn't really care about their community. Home rule will raise your taxes. And the Illinois Association of Realtors is set against home rule and will fight for the taxpayers of this community. So it, it's a bad idea. Tom Gagner. Yeah, I chaired that former government committee meeting back under in Bob Eschbach's first term. Um, and uh, we did come up with the idea that we should look at maybe a city administrator, which is not the city manager form of government. Katie's right um, about the city manager form. I don't think it's a wise decision in order to um, change that, you have to go back to a referendum, city administrator, you hire them, and if they don't work out, you let them go. Um, as to home rule raising taxes, that's not always the case, and most of the time is not the case. However, we did have a referendum on that several years ago, and the voters resoundingly said no. So uh, I think the only way that Ottawa would ever get to home rule would be by population if we grow to 25,000. Wayne Uncle Crowd, you have a take on this one? I'd just like to mention, too, that basically when you look at a, a manager or an administrator, okay, with the size of the city of Ottawa, okay, you're either going to get somebody that's on the way down, that's been up there before doing a job someplace else, or you're going to get somebody that's wanting to work their way up and move on. So you're not going to have any consistency whatsoever. So, I mean, we're not really big enough to have something like that. Uh, I feel the commission form of governor works pretty well if you're dedicated to do the job and you want to get out there, put the hours in, but it's all dedication. Okay, just hold on to that microphone, Wayne, because you get first take on our next question here. There is a need for more senior events and facilities in Ottawa, as well as more events and activities for teens and children. What is your vision to provide opportunities for these groups? Well, first of all, number one, for as far as the kids are concerned, all right, your teenagers, your younger kids and stuff like that, as you know, Marla's moved on from where I was years ago, and we've kept the parks in tip-top shape. We've added a lot of different things. We've got all kinds of programs for them. We've got summer programs for the kids to do things and enjoy themselves. Um, you know, I mean, we, we host a kids fishing rodeo. We try to do anything we possibly can. And if it was any different than it was before when I was younger, you know, it, it's hard to please everybody. We're working with uh, some other kids right now on a skateboard park, see if we can do that. Uh, we're working on a lot of other things, you know, to help out. As far as the seniors are concerned, uh, we got music in the park, we got music in the street. We try to do as much as we can. We work with the rec board. They actually throw some stuff in the, in the wintertime for them to do. And I'm ready for the red flag, so I'll pass it on. James Lass. <clears throat> Thanks, Wayne. I, I think we could do uh, a lot better with actually our active adults. I know in the last few years, nationwide, uh, pickleball has been a craze throughout, throughout the nation. Uh, there's never enough courts. There's never enough time. They're never in enough good condition. Uh, there's a number of people that enjoy that. Of oftentimes, they are of the active adult community. Uh, we've seen those individuals come up in, in every in every area within the United States, we're seeing this come up. And we do have facilities, we've been updating these facilities, and I'd like to see some more programming, potentially, of, 
uh, possibly having one of those individuals step up, maybe the recreation board hiring one of those as, as an instructor, actually facilitate a tournament within the community as it has been very well received. On the youth of our society here, when we get into, when we get into our middle schoolers, we've always had challenges with, with the kids. Those, that group of kids can be very difficult and we haven't ha really came up with a really resounding solution for that, so. Marla Pierce. So we do have some events that are good for the youth when it comes to our family friendly events, which has been talked about. The Touch a Truck Kites uh, Fall Festival, the Kitty Train. Um, music in the park is great for all ages. And we have an amazing pool that's coming to town that has zero entry. That is going to be great for those every age, the young kids, the middle kids, for the seniors, an easy way for them to access. I think with the YMCA coming, um, we are going to, they're going to have programs and with the, them teaming up with the city of Ottawa, helping with the pool, I think that we'll be able to create more activities um, to become a partnership with them. Dylan, Conley, you want to touch on this? Clayton, you want to chime yeah, in? Yeah, I got something real quick. Sure. Yeah, I believe, um, I just totally thought, lost train of thought. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go to Dylan we'll and come back. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't think teenagers are difficult. I think we were all teenagers once. I think no one's ever really asked them. I know they're hard to approach, um, but I think we need to ask them more what they might want to go on in town and then make an effort to do that. Um, as for the senior community, I think it's really important. There are tons of grants out there for building senior centers. Um, I looked into a lot of them. And this town does not have a senior center. It could work together with Bridges, but Bridges is not in Ottawa. But a partnership needs to be made to create a senior center that has activities for all levels of, of activity for seniors. Not every senior likes bingo. I like bingo. Um, but there could be yoga, there could be um, workshops about learning how to use your computer, use your smartphone, which I could also use. Um, wood shop, there could be outdoor activities. Pickleball, there are so many different levels of activity throughout life, and, and that goes for seniors as well, and that hasn't been tapped into, and it needs to be. Uh, Josh, you want to say something before we come back this way? Um, I agree with Dylan. I think that we do need a, a senior center or uh, I think we need also need a building for city rec itself so we could have the, the city rec board could have a place to have all their events and not have to rent places and go other places to uh, have to pay for the kids to play. And I think that would we could have a building for rec. You would have a building for seniors also and you could have indoor activities for them, even have pickleball. I would love to see the old Y not get torn down and turn that into it if it was able to. I know it's in a floodplain, but if they can get a grant to tear it down, can you get a grant to rehabilitate it so you could use it for city, for city stuff? Anybody else passing it back, uh, Tom? And then we'll go to Wayne and Brent. I was just gonna say, Part of the thing I, I talked about, I know, uh, on the radio was involving the community in these things. We have three awesome senior care facilities in our community who want to do more with their residents, be it Pleasant View Pavilion or Heritage Woods. Involve the staff there who are trained in senior activities. Get them involved on a city committee. Our youth, one of the things, you know, I worked for 15 years with the Boy Scouts. I know that youth want to get involved start a youth commission where we ask the high school and the, the grade schools and that to give us some of their best and brightest to help us create programs for themselves. I think there's a great opportunity for outreach and community involvement with these challenges. Tom Gagner, you want to? I would ditto just what uh, Matt said there. That's what I was going to say, but I do want to add one thing. Um, this morning at uh, Sunrise Rotary, Pamela Beckett came in and she was talking about a program they're starting in Princeton called Dementia Friendly City. I would like to look more into that and how that, and how that plans out in uh, Princeton and maybe bring that here to Ottawa too. Pass it on down the line. Wayne and uh, Brent, did you have uh, a couple of thoughts? Yeah, I'd just like to make a reminder to everybody too that the city of Ottawa also runs a NCAT bus program 
that caters to seniors and other people, but really caters to seniors to take them shopping, to take them a uh, doctor's appointment, take them any place in town. So I just want to bring that up. They, that is a resource. Brent Perrin? Just a reminder, the YMCA is going to have a community room, a c facilities for just this, to involve our youth, to involve our seniors. The hospital is moving one of their therapy units to be in with the Y. So that YMCA building is going to be a community focal point for all of these groups. And that's what we need to expand on. And I think the Y is going to do that. So we need to support the Y, we need to get behind that effort and make them a bigger part of our community. Okay, if, uh, Dylan, you want one more point? A girl can't get a, a voice in edgewise here. Um, I just want to uh, point out really quick that, I mean, Heritage Harbor, or Heritage Corridor, and Pavilion, I worked at the Pavilion, these are all great places, but that's not the only place that seniors live. Seniors live on their own, and they're active, and I think we keep bringing up the Pavilion and all these places, and we need to pick seniors up and take them shopping. Seniors are taking care of themselves, that then they would like activities, just you know, to have activities. So it's wonderful to think of seniors on the whole, and we can't forget that it's not just seniors that might need rides and and stuff. It's a full spectrum, just like every other age. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, well, K Katie, one more, and then we'll uh, go you to Clayton Brown. You know, our our youth and our seniors are the most vulnerable in our community. I'm 64, I'm, I'm considered a senior and I'm still pretty active. But they have needs for health care, for transportation. Uh, they have all sorts of needs and, and we really need to get input from the community and, and plan better activities and better opportunities for both groups of people, for, for all of them. So it's, it's not just, like Dylan said, the, the, the high rises or the um, senior living centers. We have a lot of very active seniors and, and those people need our um, attention. Um, it, it, all of them, all people need to be brought into this and, and given the opportunity to give input. And then we bring a consensus and make a plan. Healthcare, transportation, security. Big issue right now is security. Okay, pass that microphone to Clayton and uh, we'll pose another question to the panel. And you get the first answer at this one. Downtown residential opportunities, such as apartment rentals, are becoming more common in downtown Ottawa. What should be done by our city government to ensure that both local businesses and residential units can coexist in the same environment and thrive downtown without risking issues such as continual noise complaints or loss of business? Well, I know Ottawa, they received a, a grant to help uh, develop some downtown residential areas. And um, I think we need, it comes, falls back down to the parking issue. I think we need to include some more parking and get more parking involved down there for more residents to be able to live downtown. Because obviously the businesses, you know, they attract customers. Customers are taking up the, uh, the parking spots. And same vice versa with the residential. You know, the residents living downtown, they'd be parking, taking up, you know, spaces for the businesses. So we need to come up with some type idea or, or way to give the residents, you know, the, the people that live in the residential houses or buildings a place to park. Tom Ganyer? I really don't know if I can add any more than what Clayton said because I think those are the biggest issues uh, presenting with uh, downtown residential development is parking. Um, I think that we need to look at a permit program again for the, the residents also and I know that grant that we received will come up with some of those answers for us and we may need to look at some of our building codes uh, to update them in order to allow that but uh, I think we're, we do have more and more uh, downtown residential uh, 
units and there's one being redone right now on Court Street that I think is going to be an amazing unit and I think we'll see more over the years so we have to do we do have to be prepared for that. Mass Kelly. I think the the biggest thing um, <clears throat> the government can do is listen to the residents and that's just that goes along with um, you know having that coexisting relationship it's going to be you know, noise is gonna come into play as, you know, we move somebody into Court Street, you know, all of a sudden we're having concerts across the street and stuff. Obviously, the government's gonna just have to listen and adapt as we move along. Um, and that, that's the best thing I think we can say. Um, it's gonna be a positive thing as we move more people downtown. It'll make it, you know, that Norman Rockwell downtown, people walking back and forth, going home, you know, being able to shop. Um, but I think listening as a government from our elected officials to the you know the police and you know whoever, what are the problems and then, then working to come up with a, a, a solution. If it's parking, then we deal with that. If it's the noise, then we come up with you know workable solutions, knowing that concerts are only on Saturday night maybe, and they're going to be done by 11. It's all about working together to to fix the problem. Anybody else want to chime in on this one? Uh, Brent, let's, let's go to Brent Barron and then we'll come back down to Katie because she's got the next question coming up. I think your, your questions, you're looking at our comprehensive plans because we've been working on these issues on the comprehensive plan for years. And our very first comprehensive plan back in 2002, Tom, we, we identified downtown residential. We had a whole downtown plan. And the idea or the concept of downtown residential is to get people downtown, to make our downtown a more vibrant downtown. And look at it now. We have people that want to be in our downtown. We have a parking problem, like Matt said. That's a good problem. It's not a problem that we can't overcome. And as far as the parking situation is, maybe it's time we start looking at maybe putting up a parking structure where we can have, instead of just a surface lot, we have a multi-level parking lot and you'll have plenty of parking. Back to Katie, well, did you have your hand up? Uh, Wayne, you wanna chime in? Yeah, I just wanna actually bring up something too about uh, you know the parking. Everybody's complaining about the parking during the day, but I'll tell you what, you look at the parking at night, all right? It's lovely. The downtown is packed, people are at restaurants, people are eating, they're spending money in the city of Ottawa. I mean, we have a parking problem at night, too, so, you know, it's great. Pass that down to Katie. Uh, I actually think we have a people problem, and that's a great problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie Tricoli. Increased residential housing would support and maintain the growth of local businesses. Historically, downtown areas served as economic heartbeats for most cities. Many cities with unoccupied downtowns are shifting their focus to pivot and rebuild downtown areas into ur urban neighborhoods and short-term and long-term housing. Urban living has expanded the capacity and ability to support and increase local business. Essentially, more residential living means greater support for local businesses in the area. While we may have a parking problem, it's something we can solve. All right, let's move on to another question. And Katie, you have the first answer on this one. Streeter and LaSalle, Peru have both recently had their hospital facilities close. How will you, as commissioner, ensure that the community of Ottawa continues to have access to a nearby local hospital and local health care? Well, we have a lot of work to do. Any of you who know me know I don't doctor in Ottawa. Too many times I've been given bad information. Healthcare is a serious problem for rural communities. It has far-reaching effects on our community. When elected, I will reach out to our nurses and other medical professionals to find solutions and opportunities to enhance the healthcare locally. My father would say, Katie, anything you need to know, you can get a book at the library. Maybe not this time. However, there are well-informed people who have the knowledge who we can tap for tangible solutions. I'd be looking east for Rush Copley and some of the hospitals to the east 
to, to see if we could attract some of that to our community. Dylan Conley. Um, I do agree that nurses are a great resource, and Illinois is one of the few, um, well not few, there are about 30 states that are full authority for nurse practitioners, so um, nurse practitioners definitely need to be um, appreciated to their full, full ability. Um, also, rural communities need to draw in more medical professionals. They, the schools that they go to might provide them grants and, and relieve them of school debt on their end, but I think on our end, we need to provide incentives for them to come to our community. I think we need to do our part as well, and we need to provide more opportunities beside just OSF to do that. I know OSF is, you know, it, it is the only hospital we have, but we need to, we need to provide incentive for more pro medical professionals to come here and perhaps open uh, independent facilities that aren't so restrictive and will explain insurance and provide advocacy for those who don't understand medical lingual. Josh? Um, I believe they both touched on everything. I just feel that we just have to have an open communication with the doctors, the nurses that are going to come here and make Ottawa a place that they want to live, like Dylan said, to open their practices and have other options than OSF. And then just make sure OSF's facilities are running good too is just, I, I mean, that's, I don't know what else to say than what <laughs> they had to say on that. Wayne, Michael Kraut, and, uh, and Marla uh, both have something they want to chime in? I just want to say that we're fortunate where we are right now with OSF being a non-for-profit hospital. We also have the Morris campus. We also have an urgent care on the south side and the north side. And in Ottawa, we have a Planned Parenthood. So we have great access to health care here in Ottawa. And we just have to make sure that stays. Wayne Ockle Crowd and then Brent Barron. Well, Marta, you took everything I was going to say. But, <laughs> diddle. but anyway, also, too, we, ha we as NCAT work with the hospital. We have a contract with the hospital to help move patients for them. I think it's a great opportunity for us. And uh, another thing, too, involves, too, and that's just talking to the hospital and their personnel there that we deal with as a city. The main thing is to basically keep Ottawa the way it is, to make it grow, to make everything move forward so we can draw these doctors to stay here. We're trying to convince them to come to Ottawa to live. That is the main thing. That is the hardest thing to do. And with our help, we've been working with the hospital to try to do that, to show what the, the doctors and the nurses what Ottawa is really like. Brent? As someone who's married to someone who works in the healthcare industry, I'm acutely aware of the problems that are facing our healthcare. The biggest problem is recruitment of medical professionals to come to this area. And both Streeter, LaSalle, Peru, Ottawa, we've all struggled with recruiting doctors and nurse practitioners and other professionals to come and work here. We have to make this community the best community we can to make those doctors and healthcare professionals want to live here. And that's our goal. If we make this community the best it can be, the doctors will want to be here, and they'll continue to have a good, vibrant healthcare system. Okay, let's move on to another question, and James Les, you have the first shot at this one. What is the role of the City of Ottawa for funding and planning events, and in cooperating with other groups hosting events in Ottawa? And do you believe the city government should be more or less involved with these events? And why or why not? Currently, the, uh, I guess the consensus and the direction we've went with events is basically the city more or less was no longer going to be providing the events within the city. Uh, we had a public meeting a year, year and a half ago, I believe, that we actually kind of reached out to different organizations for events that we were having in the city. As, uh, such as Wine Fest, some of our more traditional ones that we've had, and we've asked other organizations to step up. We've asked them to go ahead and take the lead on those. City has a sponsorship on that, and we've kind of went in that direction with it. Previously, the city used to go ahead, provide, pay for them, 
had the staff that would go ahead and run those events. I think every few years it's, it's probably a good opportunity to take a look back and see how you're doing those, see how those changes have made in moving forward. I, th I think maybe in the next year or two we, we maybe take a look back and reevaluate that. Should the city be back in charge of running and scheduling the events? Or is it working out actually currently where we have other vendors coming in and running those? Thank you. Marla. So currently we have city sponsored events and then we have private events. And what the city should be responsible for first and foremost is public safety. With all these events, as Matt would know, doing the marathon, there's a lot of planning and Dylan does a lot of events. There's a lot of planning. There's a lot of pieces. Public safety, we need barricades. Who does that? That is the city's responsibility to, to supply the barricades and empty the trashes and do the work for the events to make sure it's a clean atmosphere. We need our public safety department to protect if we need roadblocks for parades and what it may be. And that is the biggest thing for the city is the public safety aspect of it. We need to make sure that we plan them accordingly and that they run safely for the citizens. Clayton. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with what Marla says. Um, I also think that we should probably look into bringing back Riverfest uh, the, the way that it used to be. And I'd also like to see some of the, the parade, the Riverfest parade come back. I understand the touch of truck and uh, that's a nice, nice um, event for the city. It attracts a lot of people, kids, people of all ages, that's great. And uh, the Smoketoberfest, I believe that was a good addition also. Got some more people downtown and uh, yeah. Pass that down to Dylan, you wanna, you wanna chime in, Tom? I just think that um, most of our events, if not all of our events, should be a public-private um, partnership to work together with the people that wanna do the events. There's always gonna be something that the city has to do for an event, no matter what. Whether, like Marla said, it's barricades or more, but I think we should work together on those events and make it a public-private um, partnership. Let's go to Dylan Conway. I do think on the public side, there's there's always a lot of confusion as to who is in charge of of any event that's going on in town, um, and I think that needs to be made more clear. But that being said, I think the city needs to take a more upfront stance and um, be a bigger part of events that are going in town, even if there's a private person coming up front. I think there's a lot of resources and um, things like working together with, say, the Reddick Mansion and bringing a, a historical event. We're a historical town. How great would it be to have a big historical event instead of just you know, a wine event and a beer event and, and something that's all ages, but working together with assets in town like the Reddick Mansion or, or other assets that are going on in town. And I think the city needs to be a larger part of that. Um, because between the special events committee and other things, it seems sometimes very detached, and and the public might not know who to turn to, or where to look for all the details. And I hear a lot of times, "Oh, I didn't even know that was going on." So, anybody else? Matt Skelly, and then we'll go to Wayne Eichelcraft. I would say, as someone who runs uh, a, a rather large event, utilizing. Uh, our, our awesome fire, our awesome police, and our amazing uh, public uh, works crews. Uh, the, the best thing that I think the city can do to support events like this is have a point person uh, and then kind of lay out some things. I mean, we've written checks to the city for upwards of uh, $20,000 for the support of these activities and events, putting back, so we're paying for the, the firemen, policemen, and public works. I'm not sure how many of the other um, events can say that and we're happy to do that because we know that by pay writing that check we're getting some quality a number one staffing um, from our city and, and we enjoy that that partnership um, but i also think working with your visitor center tourism promoting it um, but also having that contact person at city hall that's going to say have an overreaching can make those connections for any event. I mean, we've been doing it for nine years, so we've got a good connection, but new events need that bridge. Let's go to Wayne Eichelkraut, then we'll come back down to Dylan and uh, Katie. 
Well, first of all, I'd like to let everybody know out there that uh, we do have a volunteer organization. I oversee special events committee. Uh, we do a lot of money for different festivals going out through the city of uh, Ottawa. Okay. Besides that, we actually do music in the park, the lighted parade at Christmas time. Uh, we do kids fishing rodeo. We do music in the streets. There's many, many other things that we do. And people can come to us and ask us for money. Uh, we have a certain amount. Uh, we have plenty of money when it comes to doing kids free stuff. Uh, we love to see that. Uh, we sponsor like a movie in the park. We had the movies in the park, stuff like that. Also too about Riverfest, okay. Three years ago or two and a half years ago, Marlon and I were putting together a Riverfest, okay. We were getting ready to go. We were all set and COVID hit. Right now, we're kind of putting things on hold. We got an amphitheater coming down at Central School. I think that'd be a good time to kick it back off again and get going again. Uh, we do a, f a friendship days. It's only a two-day event with some flea markets and some music, but we still do that now just to keep it going until the amphitheater is built. But there's a lot of things. So if you need money or you want to do some kids' events, Special Events Committee is ready and willing to talk to you. Let's go to Dylan and then uh, Katie. Uh, I, I do appreciate the special events committee. They've helped me in the past. I, I do believe it's uh, up to $1,000 that they will generously give. Um, I would love to have the $20,000 available to give to the city. I do not. Um, that being said, I think it would be great if the community, if community members were able to come up to the city and say, hey, I have this great idea. Will you help me? that that's how the city could be more involved because I think the average person in the community doesn't have $20,000 to hand over to be a part of a great event idea. Um, and I think there are so many great ideas out there and so many new events that could be created um, and the communities, uh, that's where we need to start turning because things are getting stale. Um, so we really need to start turning to people and also helping create those because, I, I, again, most people don't have that cash flow. There's the same people are getting the same money. That is Katie all. Tricoli. Times have changed and the newspaper no longer gets the news out efficiently to the public. We need to bring some young people in-house into the city to do promotions and to do social media, not only for events, but also for issues that are in front of the plan and zoning committee. We need to be more um, uh, attentive to getting the information out in new ways because things have changed and the newspaper isn't really a sufficient way with a public notice to make that happen. Anybody else want to touch on this? Brent, you want to chime in? Well, I think Wayne and I don't know who else down here talked about special events at the city, but we used to have a special events coordinator working in the city, and I don't think we have one now. Now we're relying on your volunteer committee to coordinate these events. I think we need to get back to having a dedicated city employee who coordinates special events. That being the case, the debacle that happened with the third Friday last year I think could have been prevented because that was an event, it was an organic event that just grew over the last two, three years. The city really didn't have anything to do with that event. That was one person down on Madison Street developed that whole event. And then all of a sudden there was a safety issue that shut it down or tried to shut it down. Now they worked out their problems. They eventually had three nights. If anybody went down to those events last year, you saw an amazing group of people out there on that third Friday. That's what we need to get back to. We need to help people plan event, not stand in their way. So. Right. Anybody else want to chime in? Wayne? Yeah, I totally agree with you, Brent. Uh, I firmly believe that we should, we should have let her have six of them. I totally agreed with her, and I thought it was, she did an excellent job, and it was really enjoyable. 
Okay. One Marla? more thing. We do have an event coordinator at City Hall, and also as for what Katie said, the Ottawa Visitor Center does an amazing job of promoting those events. Okay, let's go to another question. And uh, Tom Gainer, you have the first crack at this one. Do you believe the canal rewatering project was economically efficient? Why or why not? And then what's your vision moving forward? What do we do with rewatering the canal? Figures I get this one. Um, <laughs> no, it was not economically efficient. Uh, former Mayor Ashbach came to the council with a plan to put water in the canal, and that's all he asked for was water in the canal. And he had a plan that was going to cost $600,000. I thought it could be a good amenity. I did vote for that. However, I didn't think $600,000 was going to make it. I thought maybe it would go up to about $800,000. We're at $1.6 million today to put water in the canal, and it doesn't work. It still needs more work. I don't think I'm in favor of putting any more money into that until we can come up with a perfect solution to make it work. It just does not work now. There was no master plan that was even asked for um, by the former mayor. He said that was going to come later from the Canal Association. Matt Skelly. Can I phone a friend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as Marlo would tell you, we, we sat next to each other the last time, and we differed on this. In, and I, I r told a story of once, while not living here, driving over grass and wondering, why is there grass and why is there a bridge? And now there's, there's water. I, I love the concept of having water in the canal. I think it, it does a lot for tourism. I think it adds to what the community is, is about and how it was founded. Yes, we have an issue with that, and I think we have to overcome that, and, and I agree. With, with Tom that putting a stay on things until we can come up with a feasible solution that will permanently put water in the canal is, is where we are. And we have it. It, it the, you know, we've done the work and now we just need to make it, you know, fix it. So is it, is it money that everybody wants to spend? Probably not, but I think there's other sources and opportunities out there with grants and so on that will help with that. Katie, you got the third take on this. Back in 1983, when I was about 22 years old, I worked on the legislation with Tom Corcoran and Charles Percy to get the canal uh, made the National Heritage Corridor. Everybody that worked on those committees wanted the canal rewatered. They wanted the canal rewatered, and we were told that if we put rewatering the canal in that legislation, that it would never pass. So it was, it was never put in the legislation. And the canal has never been funded since that legislation was passed. So it's an asset for our community. It can be a tourism attraction. We need to get it figured out and make it work. All right, let's, uh, JJ, Les, and then we'll go down to Dillon County here. I still disagree with Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Initially, when the idea came up about rewatering the canal, I was, I was very excited about it. I was very receptive. Like this great opportunity we could have downtown, we could have opportunities for uh, events, a new opportunity downtown with water. Uh, we were looking at kayaking, we were looking at fishing. It, this plan sounded amazing for tourism in town. However, that was all about a design depth that was different than what was brought out at the end. Uh, currently, what we have is a, a body of water that's approximately three feet in depth. It is one of the worst conditions you can have to try and maintain is three feet in depth. You can't maintain the algae. You can't maintain the water quality, unfortunately, the weed growth, the algae growth. What I'd like to see us moving forward, as we do have this into the community, to see the, see the canal filled in the springtime till about May, June, empty it, fill it back up in late, eight, late August, and have it through for the fall during conditions where it's not conducive for algae and weed growth, and see what it does for the next year or so before we put any more money into it. Thank you. Okay, pass that down to Dylan Conley, if you would, please. 
I obviously was not there when the canal was discussed and how far it was supposed to go out to circulate. But I, I will say, I think the water needs to be taken out immediately for health concerns. It's, uh, it smells, and once it starts getting hot, the mosquitoes will come back. You can't leave water sitting stagnant. So whether it's going to get fixed in the future, whether that's at the end of spring and draining it in the summer, it has sat way too long. This problem should have been taken care of a while ago, and I realize more money goes into draining it, but we're talking about people's health, especially the people that live near the canal, and it, it should have been taken care of, frankly. Okay, let's so. pass that back to Wayne Eichel crowd for another take. Well, I just want to mention, okay, I, I would, if I don't mention uh, July 8th, okay, will be Canal Days, okay, there is a committee right now in the process of creating Canal Days to, to try to get that going, all right, this would be the first year, uh, I think it'll be a great party, uh, the Reddick Mansion's involved, the Scouting Museum, Ottawa Historical and Scouting Museum's involved, the Canal people with the Canal House are involved, uh, we're going to get it going. Uh, we're going to give it a try the first year, but I really want to get it out there July 8th. It'll be a good time. All right. Anybody else want to touch on this topic at all? Otherwise, we'll go to our final question. And uh, Dylan Conmey has the first answer for this one. How would you, as commissioner, handle notifying local businesses or property owners of an upcoming decision that would affect their property? And what level of communication do you believe is appropriate for this situation? I don't think there's one specific form of communication that you could use that would, would reach everybody. So I think it's multifaceted. Some people still read the newspaper. Some people are avid social media users. Some people can't use social media and don't understand it. So I believe that um, we continue to use the Nextel alerts and then you should have um, have it in a, a multifaceted. Put it on Facebook. Put it on the city website. Put it in the in every aspect that you can. And I still believe that for each neighborhood, there should be a designated representative from the uh, police station because that has worked well in many cities where it's almost like neighborhood watch, but you have a specific police officer that you can turn to. Um, and I realize we need to help our officers by getting them funding to get more officers to do that. But we need to be able to reach everybody in a, in a form that they can best understand and utilize. So there would never be one form that you could do that in. Josh? Uh, can you read that question again? How would you, as commissioner, handle notifying local businesses or property owners of an upcoming decision that would affect their property? And what level of communication do you believe is appropriate for this situation? Uh, well, first and foremost, they all should have a written warning or a written a notification on anything that's gonna happen that affects them. Um, they should have some kind of way to have a, a meeting about it, and then they can discuss their concerns and their what, what else they need to make it go smoothly with the city and the, the business owners and the residents and anything. Um, like Dylan said, not everybody knows Facebook, but I know everybody, most everybody can read. So if you give them a letter that states everything that's gonna happen, they can be informed enough to decide if they need to go and ask more questions or if that's enough for what they need. All right, pass that microphone down and we'll get Brent Barron. Uh, he has the third take on this one. You are talking to the guy that's the chairman of the plan commission. And there is a process. There's a public posting of a sign on the property. There's a requirement that whatever is being done, that the adjoining property owners be served with a certified letter. And there's also a requirement that the, the plan commission posts a hearing in the paper. So there are public notices out there that are provided. However, it's not sufficient to send a business owner a letter two weeks before a project starts. Okay, so let's get that clear. I think we can do better. I think we can use social media. I think we can go to those 
property owners and we can talk to them individually about what's being done. We can invite them down to a meeting. Now, if they refuse to come or they refuse to talk to us, that's a different story. But there are ways to communicate what's going on in this town, and we can do a much better job than what we're doing now. All right. Just hold on to that microphone. We've finished our, our questions, and we're ready to go to our final remarks from each of you. 90 seconds, and we'll start with Brent Barron. Well, I want to thank everyone in the room tonight. You've heard a lot from all of us up here. We all deeply care about this community. Now we're relying on you. We need you to go out to the polls. We need you to return your mail ballots. We need you to go early vote. Hopefully when you go to the polls, you'll select me as your candidate for commissioner. I've been serving this community for 24 years. I will continue to serve this community as long as I live in it. I believe in this community, and I think you believe in this community. So I thank you again for coming tonight. Go out and go vote. Thank you. Wayne Eichelkraut. I want to thank everybody, just like Brent just said, for coming tonight. Uh, I think we had a good forum here. I think everybody got to say what they wanted to say. Um, I've been, uh, I'll go along with Brent. I've been on a city council for 24 years. I hate to say that. I've been dedicated the whole time. Uh, my number one priority is to get back with anybody that has a problem. Uh, there isn't a person that I haven't called back within minutes. As far as somebody calling me on the phone that has something, needs something done, or whatever happens, it has to be done in a hurry and right away, okay? There is never a guarantee, okay, that I can fix the whole problem, but I will investigate it, and I will take the time and dedication to see what I can do to make things work. I appreciate with everybody, and I would hope for their vote for another four years. Wayne Eichelkraut for commissioner. James Less. Thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. I, hopefully uh, you had a good opportunity to get some insight into the candidates up here so you can make an informed decision when it comes April 4th or if you do go ahead and vote earlier. In 2011, the first run at election, I fell short. I went up against four tough incumbents. It was actually former Commissioner Ed Whitney, Dale Baxter, Commissioner Awesome, and Commissioner Michael Kraut sitting next to me. I failed that first time. However, that first time that I did run, there were three principles that I ran on. And to this day, I have still not changed those principles. One was transparency, the fight for the public, transparency, that we were aware of things as much as we could provide information. Fiscal responsibility, utilizing our resources the best that we can for the best investment for our community as our resources are not unlimited. Third was dedication. My dedication and openness to speak with any residents within the community, to hear their opportunities, to hear their opinions and their concerns, to bring those to our attention. To this day in 2023, as I run for re-election, I continue to serve on those three principles. On April 4th, I would appreciate your vote and your continued support as I continue to hopefully support you as your community. Thank you. Marla Pearson. So as I stated earlier, I feel that my first four years were very successful. So I wanna tell you what I wanna to continue to do. I want to continue to fix the roads and alleys, improve the city's infrastructure, improve Allen Park and Rigdon Park, continue to recruit volunteers to get more people involved, open that pool, add a dog park and a permanent ice skating rink, develop the waterfront, we need to move the railroad switch yard. We need to continue to clean up our blighted properties and revive them to improve the image of our neighborhoods and restore, equalize, assess values, promote tourism and economic development. We need hardworking people to do this, to help build this community. So I ask everyone to vote for me, Marla Pearson, on April 4th. And Clayton Brown. I believe my background in the construction industry sets me apart from other candidates. I believe I bring a professional viewpoint to planning and development of our future infrastructure projects. I want to cultivate and attract more de development to the industrial parks and the TIF terrace in town. I want to continue to improve the city's parks and playgrounds. I want, to, I want Ottawa to be a special destination for travelers as well as families seeking better opportunity. 
Most of all, I want my children to be proud of their city. I want them to think of, I want my children to think of me when they're playing in the playgrounds or enjoying a concert along the river. I love this city and I want nothing more to be than a, a, have a chance at the table to be your commissioner. I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you. Tom Gainier. I could be just a little bit biased here, but I think we've got a great town and I love Ottawa. And just to share a little story from a friend of mine who, when he graduated from college, he moved away from Ottawa, that was 33 years ago, saying that the best job that he could get in Ottawa was a plywood salesman to, to uh, board up all the empty buildings at that time. He's recently moved back, and he's, he loves the town and what we've done with it. Um, and we've just got a great little town here. In my closing remarks, you've heard the questions and the answers from all the candidates. I hope the answers give you a better insight into what kind of commissioner each one of us would be. And I certainly hope that I'm one of those commissioners. As I stated in my open remarks, I was very fortunate to serve the citizens of Ottawa as a firefighter for more than 24 years. And now I would like to continue giving back to the community serving as commissioner again. I believe that the city is headed in the right direction. And with my diverse background, I'm well qualified to keep the city running in the right direction. I ask for your support and your vote. Early voting is currently going on at the courthouse and uh, the election day is April 4th. Please vote, thank you. Matt Skelly. A fresh voice and a positive choice. I hope you've seen the positive side that I, I hope to bring as your city commissioner. I've got a, a very diverse background. I've served youth and I've served seniors. I've raised money for both all for the betterment of their populations. Service is something I believe in. Service above self is a, a motto that I've lived with for over 25 years as a member of Rotary. And they're not just words, but they're something that we take ingrained and we actually act on them day in and day out. I think you've seen and heard the things I've done around the community, be it the OVC board with the visitor center, with the museum, the marathon, as a township trustee, I've had to do and work on items of youth and diversity and seniors and helping each of those as an elected official there. My goals are, are simple, open communication with our city staffs because they are living it day in and day out. They know what's best. Let's get their input. Public safety is huge. Let's arm our police, fire, and public works, and everyone with the best possible equipment and the best staff. Let's make it to where they want to stay here in Ottawa. If that's a new fire station north and south, so be it. And what other equipment and things, we need to find a way. And we can do that because we're Ottawa, and I've seen what this community can do coming together and making things happen. I'm excited for your vote on April 4th. Katie Tricoli. Thank you. My grandmother left Sweden and settled in Marseilles because she loved the beauty of the river valley and the bluffs. We should not squander the good things we have in Ottawa, Illinois. We should work to create a healthy quality of life for our citizens so that our citizens can enjoy. I may not have all the answers today, but the answers are in, embra are in embracing the knowledge and consensus of the people who live and work here. To quote Henry Ford, if there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. I am passionate about our community, a community I've long fought for. If you share my passion for our community, please consider giving me your vote, either early voting or on April 4th. I want to thank everyone for attending who's in this room and who is also online, who's going to see us all on social media. Thank you for participating. Dylan Conway. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, hi, Mom, if you're watching at home. Um, I, I just want to say that there, there are many things that are important to me. Transparency is obviously important. Accountability is important. Um, I think it's, it's, it, it's time that accountability be important on numerous levels. You know, if, if something's wrong, fix it, and also admit that something didn't go right. 
Um, I'd like to be approachable. I'd like to think that I'm already approachable. If you have any questions at any point before April 4th, I work at the bookstore 12 days a week. And um, you can come and, and ask me anything you like. Um, I, I think if I were voted in and elected as, as one of your commissioners, I would love to focus on, on senior issues. I think that's something that's just long been overlooked. I think that's a large part of our community. And um, I already focus a lot on kids. So that's not going to go away. I, I have over 750 teachers on my email list at work. I think that we need to form a committee that includes volunteers from the community because that needs to be the largest voice with transparency. The community needs to be involved more and we need to let them in. So we shouldn't wait to talk to the community when something's wrong. This needs to be an active part and I, I hope that I can help make that happen. Thank you. Josh Moore. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I feel like I would be a good asset to the city as a commissioner because I work in the city on a day-to-day -day and I see what's going on. And I talk to the people. Uh, I feel that we could change a lot of the wasted spending going on and use the city's assets to 100% capability. Um, I also feel like bringing some of the festivals back into in-house would let us recycle some of the earnings and make it easier for businesses to be involved and not have high fees to have booths and all that kind of stuff. It would make it more towards them instead of profiting off of it, I guess. Uh, I, I think that um, a lot of people have said that their voices haven't been heard and I can guarantee that if you make me commissioner that my voice will be heard all of your voices will be heard, and we will make a positive change for Ottawa, and I hope that I get your vote on April 4th, because I feel that Ottawa deserves more. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, I want to thank these individuals for coming up here. It's not easy being up on stage looking out there, so if I could, can we give them one more round of applause for being up here tonight? I would also like to thank Jay and Ron who ran the program down here. We appreciate your help and uh, they deserve a round of applause as well. And there are two people in the back, Julia Peterson who put together a lot of the program and a special shout out to a gentleman who saved our online presence, Josiah Pittman, wave and say hi to everybody. Uh, he really saved us today. So on behalf of the Ottawa Chamber of Commerce, I also want to invite you on Monday. We are going to have three candidates for the mayor's debate. The mayor's forum is going to be at Central School in the cafetorium. The doors will open at 6.30, the debate will be at 7 o'clock, and it will be a similar format. So please come by on Monday, and we will put it online, and we hope to get as much interest and be able to have a good, lively discussion on Monday night as well. So with that, thank you very much for attending tonight, and I agree with the candidates, Ottawa is a great place to live and work. So thank you very much, everybody.